At the close of chapter two in Genesis, we see a picture of the world where everything is very good. That's where we left off last time. No pain, no suffering, no disharmony, no struggle for survival, no sin and no death. You know, God looks at what He's done and He sees that it's very good. But if we look at the world today, we see that that's not the situation. Things wear down and they wear out, even stars. Animals and people age and die. Civilizations rise and fall. People are more easily drawn to evil than to good. That's why we have law and law enforcement in society. To, not to get rid of evil, just to keep it down. Just to mitigate the evil that's in the world. We can never wipe it out. We can never eliminate thievery or cheating or murder in any society, but we can mitigate it, we can keep it down and punish those who, you know, who disobey the laws. So the situation in the present world is vastly different than it was in Genesis chapter two when God said, He looked at what He had made and said, this is, this is very good. This problem of evil and death has been the subject of endless speculation by philosophers and theologians. Here's the question that they have asked. They ask the question, if God is omnipotent, meaning He's all powerful, He can do everything, and He's holy, why does He permit such evil in the world? You know, why did that plane fall out of the sky you know, with the, those hundreds of innocent people, so to speak, they didn't do anything to deserve uh, having their plane fall out of the sky. Why did things like that happen? How could evil have entered a perfect world? So a lot of books have been written to try to answer that question. And there have been a lot of theories given to try to answer this question, as I mentioned, through the years. For example, atheism. Atheism, a system of thought, Atheism is not simply a belief that there is no higher being. It's not that simple. Atheism says that if there is a God, He is either evil or unable to stop evil, therefore He is not Almighty God. So there may be a higher power, but He's not that high. <laughs> Maybe there's something above us, but whoever's above us, if there is such a thing, they don't have the power to stop the evil in the world, so therefore can't be almighty. Of course, some atheists believe there's absolutely zero, nothing, nada, there's nothing. There's us and then there's nothing else. Another type of thinking process or idea, philosophy, is dualism. Dualism is a philosophy that is contained in a lot of Eastern religions. It says that good and evil are dual forces that have always existed and that battle for domination. Okay? A lot of philosophy, a lot of philosophical ideas, Greek philosophical ideas uh, include this idea of dualism, the battle of good and evil. In a modern sense, uh, I think I'm looking around here and everybody here is old enough to remember Star Wars. Remember the movies that, that came out, Star Wars? Well, the Star Wars movies use this idea of dualism where the force of good through you know, Luke Skywalker battled the dark side represented by Darth Vader. And people say, young people at the time, teenagers, wow, man, what a concept, so new, we've never heard this. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. I mean, that's just the old idea of dualism. You know, the force of evil, the force of good. Sometimes the, the bad guys are winning. Sometimes the good guys are winning. They go back and forth. You know, that's dualism. Try to explain why is there evil in the world? Well, it's always existed, but good's always been there and, and the battle goes back and forth. Another concept, well, all the other isms, uh, and that's where we're studying Genesis and not philosophy, but all the other isms, materialism and secularism and humanism and existentialism and so on and so forth, these are more modern ideas and they say that life is what you make it, good or evil, or a mixture of both. Some say that there is no such thing as good or evil. You are the one who makes something good for yourself or bad for yourself. 
There's another ism here, pragmatism. Pragmatism says, well, if it's good for you, then it's good. And if it's bad for you, well, then it's bad. In other words, you're the one that decides if it's good or bad. That's pragmatism. The idea that if something works, you know, gets the job done, then it's a good thing. And if it doesn't work to get the job done, well, then it's not such a good thing. You know? A way to decide, give value to ideas, give value to systems. Now we could go on and on because each culture and generation comes up with a different idea to try to explain the origin and the existence of evil. But thanks be to God that He provided us with the true and original source for evil and the manner in which it affected the creation. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's the Bible's answer to how evil came into the world. Now, it's not the only place that mentions it, but boy, as far as the summary is concerned, it's hard to beat Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is, this is the answer. Someone says to you, you know, someone non-believer, someone not familiar with Christianity, what do you people believe about good and evil? Well, Romans 5, 12. Explains it all. Death comes through evil. Evil comes through sin, and sin comes through Humanity, man. But before man could sin, he had to be persuaded by an outside agent since there was nothing in, in him to lead him to sin. Remember when God looked at everything and He says, it's good? That included man. There's nothing inside of man that would lead him to do something wrong. So it means that the allurement to do something wrong came from outside of man, okay? It came from outside of man. This is why in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we have a description of Satan in disguise as a serpent. Remember I said, the allurement to do what was wrong, to disobey, didn't come from within man, it comes from without of him. Well, who on the outside allured him? Who seduced him? The answer, the Bible said, Satan did. And the original story for that is in Genesis chapter 3, 1. Let's look at that. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Again, I'm looking at this crowd and I think a lot of you remember Johnny Carson. Remember Johnny Carson, Late Night with Johnny Carson? It was a talk show, if you didn't happen to see that, if you're like from Canada or something, you know. But Johnny Carson had a sidekick named Ed McMahon, you know, and they used to patter you know, back and forth, joke back and forth on his show. And one of their shticks, one of the little thing, routines they used to do was, who was smarter, a chicken or a pig? And they used to go back and forth, you know, what, what was smarter, a chicken or a pig? You know? And the point was that, well, some animals seem smarter than other animals, okay? Well, the Bible says that in the pre-sin world, the serpent was the most intelligent of creatures, animal world. It says here, you know, uh, crafty, the word subtle here or crafty means cunning, cunning. Now this is the first appearance of Satan in the scripture. We don't know this right away, but in Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, the Bible says that the serpent was the devil himself. Now, not very much is written directly about Satan. There is no narrative in the Bible that describes you know, step by step. Like in, in Genesis, you have a kind of a day by day account of how God, how God and when God created the the world, the universe, you know, day one, day two, you know, there's a step by step, but there's no chapter and verse that says, you know, uh, description of Satan, you know, well, once upon a time there was this, you know, there's no place in scripture where you have three or four chapters in a row that gives you all the information about Satan. You've kind of got to go here and there and, 
and kind of find it on your own and, and, and bring it together. So we learn about him through references actually from the prophets who compared human situations to things that Satan uh, did or things that happened to Satan in the spiritual world. For example, one of the prophets was Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote the following in chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, and I'll read it and read along with me. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Now, here the prophet Isaiah is talking in a literal sense about the king of Babylon. In a literal sense, in a historical sense, at the time when uh, Isaiah wrote these words, he was referring to the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon who had become proud thinking that he had conquered the world on his own strength. And Isaiah warns that God will bring him down because of his pride. And of course if we read in the Bible we find out that historically God did bring the king of Babylon down. The king went mad and he ran around thinking he was an animal for several years until he repented and then God reestablished his throne and God put Nebuchadnezzar back on the throne. So that's in a literal sense, in a historical sense. But in a spiritual sense, Isaiah is comparing what happened to this earthly prince to what happened to the prince of the heavens, Lucifer. His name Lucifer meant day star. Apparently, Lucifer had become proud as the chief of angels, and he desired to rise above God. Now some say his sin was to disbelieve that God had actually created him, and he assumed that he had evolved to this height, and now he could go higher in the evolutionary chain in the spirit world to become the first, even beyond God. And so Isaiah says that this sin of pride caused his downfall from his lead position and ultimately brought him to the pit of hell, created specifically for him and for those who followed him. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. On a side note, we note that hell, this place, was created after the earth. Some people say, you know, when, did, when was hell created? It's got to be after the earth because when God looked at His creation, what did He say? He said, it's all good. Hell is not good. So hell is a created thing, right? So it was created after the earth since there was no need for it before. So there's an example of the, what, what's called the dual nature of prophecy. There's the literal meaning of it, what it meant right away in the historical context, and then there's the meaning of it in the future. Same story, same words referring to two different things. Sometimes it can refer to three different things. What's going on kind of right now or in the immediate future, what's going on in the intermediate future, maybe a hundred years from now or so, and what will happen at the end of time. And the context is what actually helps you understand what's going on, okay? So in Isaiah, we understand the context. Isaiah's time when he lived, who was the king, we know he's talking about uh, the king of Babylon. But we also know, because we know Genesis, that he is also making a, another reference to the spirit world. Let me give you another example of this, and this is in Ezekiel chapter 28, a little longer passage, Ezekiel says, 
<clears throat> Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald. And the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, and you will cease to be forever. Ezekiel chapter 28. So in the same way, Ezekiel now he makes a prophecy against many kingdoms in his book around Israel and he warns them about what is to befall them because of their sin. So one after, this kingdom and that kingdom, this is what's going to happen to you and this is what the Lord said that's going to happen to you and so on and so forth. And then eventually one of the kings and one of the kingdoms that he is prophesying against is the king of Tyre. He says it in the very first verse. It was, Tyre at the time was a very wealthy nation based on its trade and its shipping ability. Modern day Tyre is Lebanon. We call it the country of Lebanon. As, um, as um, its king rather, excuse me, its king thought that his island city, uh, and at the same time it was an island city and capital, was impenetrable and he scoffed at the idea that this nation, which was at its height of power for almost 600 years, from the 12th century to the 6th century BC, Tyre, you know, in one form or another, was a powerful uh, shipping nation, very powerful and very wealthy. So at its height, okay, I, uh, uh, Ezekiel says, you're coming down. You know, God has taken you down, basically. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king you know, that he just prophesied against, you know, that particular king, well, that particular king, he destroyed Jerusalem. And true to Ezekiel's prophecy, he also laid siege to Tyre as well. And listen to this, after 13 years of warfare, he eventually conquered the city, thus ending its dominance. And so Ezekiel said it would be reduced to a bare rock, and that has been so because it, re it really never again regained its prominence throughout history. I mean, it became a city and there were people that lived there, but it was no longer a power in, in any sense of the word. So in a spiritual sense, Ezekiel is also referring to another fall that he compares the king of Tyre to, and that seems to be the fall of Satan. In other words, Ezekiel's writings mirror very much Isaiah's writing in describing the fall of a human king or prince okay, that mirrors the fall of Satan. So here's some insights that we gain from Ezekiel's writing concerning Satan. First of all, he is a created being. When I say he, we're talking about a spirit being, and usually we refer to spirit beings as he. He was created, in verse 13b it says, 
He was wise and beautiful. You know, we always see Satan as something very ugly, you know, but originally Lucifer, angel, day star, very, very beautiful. It says he was in Eden and was part of the pre-sin world. Think of it, think of it. He was part of the pre-sin world. Also says he was a guardian. What was he doing in Eden? It says he was a guardian. He covered. Perhaps what he was guarding was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and had access to the throne of God, which is the holy mountain. Because where did Eve meet the serpent? Well, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says that Lucifer, okay, day star, most beautiful of angels, his task was to cover, to guard. What was the most precious thing that existed? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it had the power to give one you know, uh, eternal life. And he had access to the throne of God. Number five, he was created perfect. Like man, there was nothing, you know, you know, when God saw everything that he had created, he said it was good. Number six, his sin was from within. He was not subject to external temptation like Eve was or Adam was. And the source of his sin, Ezekiel says, was pride in his beauty. Now when we think of beauty, we think, oh, good looking, handsome guy, you know, she's, a, she's hot, you know, we think beauty like that. But in the Hebrew, the word is brightness, which is translated beauty. It's brightness, intensity. Okay? Verse 17a. Also we learned that the result of this sin was to try to lift himself up. In other words, to change his position beneath God to be equal with God or even greater than God. And when I say that the, the passage in uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel are complementary, they both talk about the same kind of sin. And in Jude, the New Testament, in Jude verse six, Jude also confirms that the sin of the angels, the reason they were cast down, was that they left their position. You see what I'm saying? So the, you're wanting to know, what did he do wrong? He left his, he was given a position and he wanted to leave his position. There's all kinds of speculation you know, about you know, the, the angels that came on earth and had women and did we'll, we'll talk about that. When we get there, we'll talk about that. But at the moment, these two prophets suggest to us that the sin was pride. Not to go down to the earth, apparently it says he was already there but rather to consider himself greater. And you know, what's the cardinal sin? What's the number one sin that's happening? You know, yeah, pride, isn't, don't we say? I mean, so many other evil things come from pride. What, why do wars happen? You know, you know, I, I mean, we're only speculating, I'm no political pundit, but I would, I would suffice to say that a lot that's going on with Mr. Putin you know, in, in this day and age has a lot to do with his hurt pride and the hurt national pride of that particular country that once was great and feels now set aside and ridiculed. We can't imagine how many wars started just because of hurt pride. It's amazing. How many people have been killed just because of hurt pride? Number nine, it says that this sin caused his destruction, verse 17 to 19. Now the prophets in the Old Testament and John in the book of Revelation speak in terms that this has already been done. In other words, they say, and you're destroyed, you know, like it's already happened. But remember, when prophets speak about what God is going to do, they always talk about it as a, in French we say, un fait accompli, a done thing. So when God says this, is, this happened, even if the actual thing is only going to happen in a thousand years, the prophets talk like it's, it's already happened because if God says it's going to happen, it's like a sure thing. It's 100% sure. So that's why it conf it's confusing to figure out the timeline there. 
Suffice to say, when the prophet said, you're destroyed, you're done, even, well, they say, well, how come Satan's still here? He's still doing something. It's because it's a sure thing, okay? And then finally, he no longer has his position as one who stands as first before God or guards or covers. He lost that position. Now his spiritual abode is the pit of darkness. His place in the world is no longer as guardian of the tree, but as an enemy, as an adversary. As a matter of fact, the word Satan in Hebrew means adversary. You know, when Peter says, your adversary, the devil, well, adversary, how'd you like to have that to be your name? You know, my name, yeah, adversary Smith or you know, whatever. That's his name, adversary. And what do they say? He's lurking about in a serpent's body, so to speak, ready to attack those who come by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it kind of sets the scene for what's taking place in Genesis. What's the serpent doing there? Why is he there? What's going on? Well, these two prophets give us an idea of what may have transpired before and why Satan is there and so on and so forth. All right, let's talk about Satan and the serpent because we've got to move. Let's go to, now that we've done Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 A, let's move to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 B at lightning speed. It says, and he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The question is, why a serpent's body and how a serpent's body? Hmm? Now, let's not get confused. There are two trees here, two significant trees in the garden of evil. One tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the other tree is the, of the forbidden fruit, okay? So let's not get confused here. Uh, we said before, he may have been the guardian of the, the knowledge of good and evil tree, but now he meets Eve, where? In, the, in front of the tree uh, of um, the forbidden uh, fruit. Again, who knows the proximity of these places here uh, in the Bible? So the question is, why a serpent's body and how a serpent's body? We arrive in an area where the Bible really doesn't give a lot of information. You just have to kind of deduce based on what you know. So what do we know? Well, we know that Satan has fallen. He's no longer in the presence of God. Perhaps because of this, he no longer is beautiful. He's no longer bright. In 2 Corinthians, it says that Satan only disguises himself as an angel of light, not that he is one. And it may be why Paul uses that term that he disguises himself as an angel of light because maybe that's what he was once, but he no longer is. He takes the body of an earthly creature to hide his true identity, which might have been a warning to Eve. Remember, she's no dummy. She knows the creation. She understands what God has made, what's what, who the animals are. So Adam and Eve were intelligent and they were spiritually discerning people. They may have known who he was if he appeared as himself. Again, we're, we're speculating here. I always want to make sure, but that's, that's fine. We're allowed, to, we're allowed to say we're guessing, we're thinking, we're trying to come to conclusions. Number two, the serpent is naturally a wise and crafty animal, superior to the others in the animal kingdom. The word serpent actually, again in the Hebrew, means to hiss, to hiss. It also meant to whisper. So how a spirit inhabits a physical body is unknown to us. The Bible tells us that it happens for both evil and good. Uh, the interesting thing is that evil spirits, they possess people in order to control them and the Holy Spirit indwells people in order to live with them. Spirit beings, but very different in their relationship with human beings when they come together. There's always a debate about whether or not Satan or an evil spirit can still possess people today. There are good arguments on both sides, but one thing is sure, and this is what I want you to remember about that argument, Satan or his angels cannot inhabit one 
in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. Okay? And the reason we know that is because the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, John says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The he that is in the world he's referring to is Satan. And the he that is in you is the Holy Spirit that we receive at baptism. And so he's assuring Christians, hey, the spirit of evil may be out there, maybe, maybe still has power over others, non-believers, to possess them, to manipulate them, but does not have the power to overcome you, to possess you, the Christian. Uh, number four, <coughs> another point that a lot of people speculate on was, who was doing the talking? Because the serpent talks to the woman. Who's, who's doing the talking here? So there are three possibilities, okay? Number one, the devil spoke through the serpent. That's one possibility. <coughs> Number two, the serpent spoke and Satan guided and controlled its speech. We'll talk about that in a minute. And number three, the snake telepathically communicated to Eve's mind these thoughts and these words. I mean, you know, we're presented with a scenario that is so bizarre to us, you know, a snake talking to a person. And, and, and the Spirit of God doesn't break it down for us and say, well, let, let me, you know, God doesn't say to us, well, let me explain how that could happen here. But He doesn't. He just said, this is what happened. And we're going, OK. I get the idea that there's a snake, and I get the idea that there's a person, and I get the idea that there's conversation, but I don't get the idea of how the conversation took place between a human being and a snake. This I don't get. And you know, he's left us wondering about it. So we're in the wonder, we're wondering here. This part of the class, we've got a few minutes left, okay? So let's take the A part. You know, the devil speaks through the serpent. If Satan possessed the snake, then it's certainly possible for him to speak through a creature that didn't normally speak. Satan had, after all, a lot of power. I mean, Remember Balaam in Numbers 22, the Old Testament book, Numbers 22, verse 28. Balaam, this false prophet, this evil prophet, his donkey spoke to him. God rebuked this false prophet, Balaam, by talking to him through his donkey. And when you read that, we won't, we won't read it, but when you read that story, it's almost comical. You know, he gets off the donkey, you know, the donkey sees an angel. <laughs> And, he, and he's afraid, he doesn't want to go forward because the angel's going to kill them both, you know? So he stops. And, and the way he stops is he, he moves over and he, he crushes the, the guy's leg against the wall, you know? And the guy's, what is wrong with you? You know, he's pulling that mule, that donkey, you know, and he's whipping him. And then the donkey, you know, is still afraid and throws him off. And the guy, you know, is just beating that animal, you know? And then finally the animal talks to him and said, hey, why are you beating on me? Haven't I been obedient all these years? Haven't I done everything you wanted me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Having a conversation. So I'm thinking, well, if the Spirit of God can talk through a donkey, I figure you know, maybe the Spirit of Satan can talk through a snake. I mean, maybe it's possible. So the argument against this, however, playing both sides, five minutes left, we've got to run is that Eve, who like Adam ruled over the animal kingdom, would have seen something unusual about a snake talking. I don't know about you, but if a snake started to talk to me, I'd take a hard, long look at my medicine and call Dr. Carey. I'd say, I don't know what you're giving me, man, but I may have taken too much of it. All right, so let's look at number B. If Satan guided the snake's speech, then it seems some animals perhaps could talk, perhaps could communicate with human beings. We, we don't know the priests in world, we don't know. The snake, it says, was the smartest, perhaps this denoted speech capability. This might be possible in a priest in world, and scientists, you know, they found traces of speech mechanisms and patterns in animals, in various animals. This would explain why Eve was not alarmed at the snake's speech. Again, we're, spec we're speculating. 
And then, then there's the Hollywood point of view where Eve is thinking these things in her mind, a kind of a self-talk with the devil in her heart, with the devil truly present in the form of a snake. The, uh, this, of course, sidesteps you know, the tricky problems of a snake actually speaking somehow, but the words of the Bible do say that somehow they were communicating together. Exactly how and why, we're not quite, we're not quite sure. In any event, we have the woman in the presence of the tree, um, who is um, uh, the, uh, in presence of the tree uh, the for, of the, with the forbidden fruit. We have a serpent possessed by Satan in some way who will lure her into using her free will to disobey God. This we know, this is not up for debate. I just wanted to chase these little rabbits here because uh, we don't normally take the time to do this. But again, it's just speculation. We're just speculating about it. One day we'll know, you know. And I don't know about you, but that may not be the first question that I, that I will. Uh, maybe who, you know, is O.J. guilty? Maybe that one might, might, might be the question I'll ask, but you know, uh, who knows? All right, so next week, all right, next week, uh, the serpent and the woman. Next week we'll, we'll, we'll stop chasing the rabbits and we'll get into the, the actual context and the text itself and we'll see how, you know, the, see the fall of the woman, what took place uh, in, this, uh, in this dialogue. All right, that's it for tonight's lesson. Thank you for your attention.